Let's create our own custom malware. Let's write malware that can hook into other programs, applications, and software, and see what files other users create or write to, and maybe even manipulate them, modify them, and tamper with the file contents so the user is completely unaware. Let's dive in. So I'm gonna open up Visual Studio because I wanna create a compiled binary on Windows, right? The program and application itself should be an executable file or an exe. So we'll write this in C, C++. We're going to end up renaming it all working with C. But if we create just an empty project, we'll go ahead and click next. We can call this my malware and then we'll build it. Go ahead and click create. Now that Visual Studio is fired up, let's make sure to set this to release mode, x64 bit architecture. And I'll go ahead and create some files here. In the source files, I'll add a new item for our main.c. And actually, we do need to lay some foundations. We do need to actually put together some structures like the blueprints that we can use to navigate through an executable file, right? So let me create some header files. I'll go ahead and work with just what I'll call structs.h. How about that? We'll add that file as a header file and we'll go ahead and I want to include windows.h. We'll need that header file because we will be working with some of the windows structures here, but let me show you what these all are. Because we want our malware to hook into other programs or other executables, executables, we should have a good idea as to how those exe files, those portable executable files or PE files are made up. What is their file format and what do we need to sort of crawl and walk and navigate through to get to some of the juicy information that helps our malware? This is a really good graphic that outlines the sort of layout of those portable executable files, those .exe files, the programs and applications, right? They start with a DOS header, then a DOS stub, NT headers for new technology in these Windows binaries, NT signature, file header, optional header, data directories, and other sections. Now, this is one graphic, but there's another really good one. Now, I know this is massive, there's a whole lot here, but it digs down into those different headers and sections necessary for a binary and application to run. And that might be some important language to use too, right? Because when we're talking about these executable files, the programs, like as they're sitting on your desktop or on your computer, just sitting on the file system, they are unmapped. But when you actually run it, when you start the application, they are mapped into memory, all defined by different structures set up in the code. So first things first, our objective and our goal is to sort of recreate and put together those same structures structures and understand how these all work together. So let's get back to Visual Studio and let's try and define some of these structs the exact same way that they would be represented within internal windows, right? Say there's the image DOS header. That's the name of a structure that's commonly used in the windows internals. But if I control click on this, you'll be able to see, oh, that's actually already defined for the winnt.header file. Now I can click into this and we can see literally how this is all put together. Here is is a struct for the image DOS header and all the pieces and components that are necessary here. Now, I don't mean to drag you through all of this, but I do want to copy and paste this so we have that syntax. And there's one that's really important here. There's one component that is the ELFA new. That is actually the offset to the NT headers, which we know is the next sort of layer in the structure of the executable file that we need and we want to walk through. So let's go slap this into our own code, replace that dummy structure that we were just building out and now we need to go grab the image NT headers, right? Let's see if I can create again a new struct for image NT headers and I'll just make a little skeleton here, but I do want to control click on that name and see, oh, yep, we find it just again down below for 64 bit or 32 bit architectures. Let's double click on those and try to see how they all put them together. They do have different definitions based off the architecture of the computer that you're using. So we'll copy these and let's see if we can grab the appropriate structures as needed. Let's slap in these definitions here and let's go grab the image NT header 64 and image headers for 32 bit. I see them defined down here. Let's go ahead and grab those, paste these in. And now we can see, Hey, we've got the file header, another type that needs to be included along with the optional headers, all these things that need to be baked into our own code here for us. I can go ahead and simply control F for the image file headers over in our win NT header file. And this is the the structure set up for the file format. This has 
some interesting stuff like the number of sections, time date stamp, any other characteristics that might be worthwhile that we can go look into with documentation. But truthfully, all we need is to just slap that in. Now we do need to get the optional header. That is something that is not really optional, right? I can go search for those image optional headers, but bear in mind, we need a 32-bit copy and a 64-bit copy. So let's go ahead and grab the 32-bit one, and this has a lot of worthwhile information for us. In fact, it includes some of a really interesting concept that we should get into in just a moment. Let's go paste these in here and go grab the 64-bit ones. Here is one just as well. Let's go ahead and make sure we can grab that. Now this structure has two super important concepts sort of baked in. It has the number of RVA, RVA something we want to chat about, and different data directories. That acronym, RVA, stands for Relative Virtual Address, and that represents an offset, like from the beginning of the PE file or portable executable to an actual virtual address, where code or data functions might be stored. To get the virtual address, all you need to do is simply add the base address of the module to the relative virtual address, and then you can access whatever code, data, or information, regardless of how that is mapped into memory while it's running. That is super duper helpful for us because, again, we're sort of crawling, walking, navigating through a whole binary or portable executable. So we might be able to then reach those data directories. Like I was just alluding to, some of those are super special because you can have the the exports directory or even the imports directory for other functions, modules, and methods that are pulled in from things like DLLs or dynamic link libraries. Those structures that we just saw, the data directories, those actually include a virtual address and we can use those to access other functions the real program might execute, like saving a file, writing to a file, creating or opening a file. So let's see if we can grab that image data directory structure, see if we can go track it down and see, ooh, how is that actually built? Can we craft one of those or at least have a better understanding of it? Looks like we can, and just as I said, includes a virtual address and size and the number of directory entries we should keep track of. Now here's where things get interesting because those other applications try to call back to more like Windows internals, things like kernel32.dll or common functions used by a whole lot of applications, like, as I said, writing, saving, opening files, so we could actually see that. If I were to open up a tool called PEBear, something that allows me to literally look inside a portable executable, I'll go navigate to load a portable executable. I'll go to system 32 and I just want to look at like notepad, right? The simple text editor built in comes with windows. I'll open that up and look at all this stuff here. But one thing that you might be able to see is this imports table. Now there are a ton of cool things here. There's that kernel32.dll. Again, like native core of Windows, usually imported for a whole lot of applications. And down below, we can see some of the functions that are accessible thanks to those addresses and the relative virtual address here, the RVAs, and some here would be worthwhile. Here's one, create file W. You can see this call via column. That is a little bit of the offset for how we might be able to go access that function while it's mapped and running in memory. PE Bear also shows us something really interesting, and that is the thunk. I know it sounds weird, you can see in that column here, the thunk is an array that when the program starts to run, when it's actually executed and all mapped into memory, that thunk array will then be filled with the absolute actual address of a function that it wants to call out of the imports table. Now we have a couple more structures that we need to add in to build out that whole layout of our portable executable and image, right? So let me add a struct for the underscore image, what is it, section headers, right? For the dot text section, for all those other pieces. The section header, if I go look for and explore that, we can see that it is included again in that WinNT, and this includes some really, really worthwhile information because we can see the virtual address, we can see some memory permissions, this one is absolutely crucial. Now, we've sort of built out the skeleton for all these different headers and sections and things that are important and necessary for our portable executable or PE file and the image that we'll work with in our malware, right? Now, I'll be the first to admit, that's a lot of stuff, and I just sort of steamrolled through a whole lot of those structures. But if you're interested, there are a handful of other additional references, links, and resources that I'll add in the video description and maybe make that a bit more accessible for you. These all come 
come from Hex Rick's blog, so hey, kudos and credit to Hex Rick. Now we've set the groundwork, but we still need something to even load our malware or stage it so that it can be injected into processes where we will hook some of those functions that they might call in or out of the import address table or the IAT. The way that we can do that is by actually staging a DLL and we could do something called like, oh, proxy DLLs, but honestly, we should just try to inject or load a DLL into another remote process like Notepad that we were playing with earlier. So to keep that easy and streamlined for us, I wanna use some of the code from Maldev Academy. Maldev Academy is the sponsor of this video and hey, huge thanks to them bringing in all this great and incredible education. If you haven't seen it before, link in the video description, you can seriously learn so, so much. But hey, let me get into some of the modules here and I'll show you in the sections on DLLs, when you're learning about, oh, the Windows architecture, payload execution, whether it's DLL or others, we should try to dig into process injection DLLs injections being added to other remote processes. They offer a ton of stuff in here that explains all of this for us, but truthfully, I want to press the I believe button and let's go ahead and download the code here. You can see that down the top right, we'll download it. And by the way, the whole virtual machine that I'm using is from Maldev Academy in their course. And even the references and resources that I've showcased, that is all from the Maldev Academy material. But let's dive in to that remote DLL executor, the injector here, we have the solution files so we can dig into the code, but take a look. Inside of the main function, we do some simple stuff. Hey, just offering some capability with command line arguments to supply your DLL and the process we want to inject into. And then we grab the remote process handle. We have some functions conveniently set up to inject our DLL and then do what we need to do. This is all done with some of the Win32 API functions, virtual alloc X, write process memory, virtual protect X, create remote thread, etc., etc. I don't want to beat that up too much because it is a lot of the stuff that we've chatted about in other videos, but I hope that's pretty cool and worthwhile for you to just fire up here. You're going to hate me, but now that we've kind of walked through all of the sections and headers, the structures that are necessary for understanding the portable executable file format, we can honestly kind of put these away and let's just create a new solution, a new project, because we know we need a DLL. Let me search for simply a DLL. We will need a dynamic link library. We'll go ahead and click next on that. We can call that our malware and let's go ahead and click create. And okay, now we have our DLL main. Uh, I will change that from .cpp to just simply .c. I will go ahead and remove some of the boilerplate uh, that Visual Studio puts in. I believe if we just include Windows, it should be good with all those types there. And now we can get back to work because our DLL, when it's attached, when it's invoked and running here, we can do a couple different things. Ultimately, we want to run our malware, right? So let's define some of the functions for that, but let's build out some convenience functions or utilities that we might need. We will of course break after this and let me leave that commented for now, but the case of the DLL process attached is really where we want stuff to happen. First, let's go ahead and create some header files for our utilities. In a utilities.h file, I'm just gonna declare a little void function to enable a debug console. I think that will be helpful for us just so we can see things that are coming from the target process, the portable executable file or notepad that we wanna be hooking. Let's put together the C source code for that. We'll go ahead and include our utilities.h and let's define that void function, enable debug console. And this is just simply for convenience sake. If we can allocate a console, we can go ahead and create some file pointers for standard output and standard error and just sort of map those streams together. Uh, let me make sure to include the standard io.h header file so we'll have access to those types. And now that looks good. Now let's finally create the structure of our malware. Let's go ahead and add the header files, the source code, and ultimately our goal is to hook the IAT or import address table. Let's create a little malware.h header file here. And we had that, what is it? Void uh, run malware was the name of the function that we wanted to call. Uh, let's add the semicolon there. And now let's go define that. Create a new source file, malware.c. Here we'll include our malware.h header file. And let's make that function simply run malware. We can go ahead and start small. We'll just do a couple print statements. Running our malware, new line. 
line, semicolon, looking good. Now remember, we need to hook the IAT, right? That's the next function that we need to put together where we finally start to walk through, crawl and navigate all around the PE or portable executable file structure. Let's put that in another header file just so we can kind of keep our code organized. Let's try to, uh, prototype out the declarations here for the functions that we want to write. So let's hook our import address table. And we know that we need to do this from the target executable, right? We're going to end up storing that as a byte. So we just sort of know, oh, this is the beginning or the base of that PE portable executable image. We'll call that pointer for our targets. We do need the module, of course, for that. So let's do an H module handle there. PCW string. This is the name of the function, the Win32 API function that we want to hook into, and then we can pass in our replacement, the function that we want to call instead, or rather than that original function in the import address table. So that's defined. Now we can go start to write this in its own .c source file. Add a new class, iathook.c, looking good. Include the headers as usual. Let's paste in the function definition here, and then let's start to try to pull out all the sections, all the headers that we need for this portable executable file image, right? We're first gonna define a pointer for our image DOS header. And we'll go ahead and cast that from our P byte target. So let's grab that when it's actual uh, P image DOS header based off around wrapping and casting our P target. And now what we wanna do is actually validate and make sure that we're working with the real portable executable image file, a real .exe. So let's check if that p image DOS header, and because it's a pointer, we'll use the arrow syntax, the hyphen and the greater than symbol. And let's go reach that structure's e magic, the e underscore magic, that is the magic number, bear in mind. If it's not equal to our image DOS signature, well, okay, we know that we are probably not working with a real executable here. In which case, we should just bail out, we'll go ahead and return null. This is a super good process that's outlined in Maldive Academy where you should really make sure, hey, you're working with an executable file here. So try to go through those if statements and checks. Let's do the exact same style of thing for our NT headers. We can go ahead and validate that they are what they should be. Remember, those NT headers are based off of the start of our PE file, P target, adding the P image DOS headers and pulling out that ELFA new, right? We'll remove the S there at the very end. Again, that's how you could go reach and access those NT headers. Now that we have that saved, we'll do the exact same check as we did previously, but making sure that these match, we'll reference its signature property, and we'll make sure that matches the image NT signature. If it doesn't, we return null because it's bad. Now we can start to pull out all the other headers, sections, and structures that are worthwhile for us. We know we want the optional header. We can simply pull that out of our NT headers. We have that already. We can then get the data directories that are pulled out of the optional headers. Imp data dir can equal here indexing for the image directory entry import. That is one of the constants to be able to grab that table but we do need to pull out the actual uh, table itself with the p image import descriptor. p import address table, we'll go ahead and cast that. Given the import data directory's virtual address added to the base of our PE file or P target as the start. So we'll just do that imp data dir dot virtual address. There we go. We'll define size T IAT size. We can set that to the data dir's size property, but we'll divide that by the size of all of the different import directory descriptors there. And now we want to look through all of the entries and try to find the name of the function that we want, right? So we're going to try and find it, in which case we should look through all of the entries. So we need to probably keep track of that with a found variable that we can kind of manipulate inside of a loop. So let's start our loop, right? For size t i equals zero, i is less than the iat size, of course, i plus plus as we increment through it. Oh, and that should be all caps false, my bad. Now let's get a character array for our function name. That's a pointer, right? Now we start at our base from the portable executable. We're adding in our import address table and 
at index i, right, as we're looping through each of them, trying to check out the name variable, that structure property that we saw. Now, all we need to do is check if the names match, if the argument that we provided to our hook IAT function matches the current name of the function that we're looking at in the import address table entries, then we're good. But we do need a convenience function, a little bit of a utility to be able to easily check if those are equal. We can do an if is equal C string, but we kind of need to build out that function and let's put that in our utilities. Back in the utilities header file, let's create an is equal C string function that should take in a long pointer C string wide character thing, string one, right? And then another input LPCWSTR string two. How about that? Oh, we will need to include the Windows header there yet again, uh, I believe alongside the standard IO.h. Okay, so there we go. All those types are good. You know what, while we're here, we should probably build out another convenience function to handle like wide strings. If a W string is equal to a C string and actually do that properly, uh, we could build that out too. Back in the utilities.c source code file, uh, I don't wanna bore you with the entire implementation of all this because it's just manipulating C style strings and it's, you know, exactly what that would be. A couple string compares eventually. So we will press the I believe button on that and let's get back to our IA hook implementation. Now for our is equal C string argument here, we'd pass in the module name that should have been an argument. Uh, did we supply that as an argument? No, we passed in a, I, I feel like that should have been the module name that we're actually looking for. Let me replace that with the C string there. Uh, I think that's fine. Now we want to check that the P function name that we just declared above is what it should be. If that is true, we can try to build out a new function, right? Where we'll actually do, oh, patching the import address table entry here. We will can define that function in just a second, but it seems like that's where we should be. Uh, we could probably check, oh, like if that succeeds, in the case that it does, we would return true, right? Or found would equal true. We'll build out that function in just a second, but now we can kind of say, oh, if we did actually find it, then we'll go ahead and use our own implementations. Again, that we'll build out for like, oh, the get proc address, we'll make a replacement for that and a get module handle replacement, we can create our own for those. And then that will be displayed and given as the function that we want to call. We've hooked it. We'll build that out, but in case that doesn't happen, obviously our worst case scenario, we bail and we simply return null to end that function. Next, we really have to patch the import address table. We can't get around it, we have to do it. Let's build out the function to patch IAT. Since this will do a little bit of memory modifications, we should probably keep track of the standard page size of memory, which is 4096. And we can go ahead now and build our bool patch IAT entry function. As usual, that takes the pbyte pointer for our target or the PE and portable executable file we're working with. We do need the PC string for our LP API name, the function that we want to work with. And of course, the P image import descriptor, the record or entry in the import address table that we're going to mess with. And that should be P module entry and P void finally with the replacement call that we want here. Remember that replacement comes from our hook IAT function. So this is just a convenience thing for us, but we should go ahead and grab that definition and go paste it back for our header file just as well. Looking good. Now we got to use some of the magic that we know of the import address table and the thunk array to be able to pull this stuff out here. Let's grab a long pointer for our original thunk. Sounds so silly, but that should be the P target, the start of the portable executable file with our module entry that we're passing in, reaching the original first thunk. We'll create another one of these, but we'll call that just a current thunk. And we'll pull that from not the original first thunk, but the first thunk. And then we'll check once again, as we loop through things, whether or not we have found it yet. So we'll have a variable created for that. And then we'll start to loop. We'll do it while the original thunk is not equal to null. So while we can clobber things the best that we can, we'll go ahead and grab the import by name. That can be our P target plus the address of the original thunk. So we're just moving to that location of sort of in memory here. We'll check, we'll do a simple string compare if our import by name 
pointer here, actually referencing its name, matches the LP API name that we provided. If it is zero, again, if that string compare means they're the same, there are no differences, then found is equal to true. We found it. We found the function that we want to clobber. Now well, let's go ahead and modify the protections. We need to modify those memory protections. We can set a D word protect variable to zero, and let's use our virtual protect to change that thunk, given the page size, to page read write, so that we can actually clobber that. We'll go ahead and store the old value in the protect variable that we just kind of crafted here, and now we can go ahead and set our thunk pointer for the active current thunk to be the replacement. What we want to run instead of the usual import address table function, we'll call our own function. Then we can just go ahead and put the memory protections back in place. We'll switch that back to protect. That was the original there. Outside of the if statement, but still within our loop, we do need to increment our original thunk because we're moving through those entries. The same thing with our other thunk. And with that, we have our patch IAT entry function complete. Let's scroll back up though, because that is what we want to run here. So our if patch IAT entry, remember we pass in our target, we pass in our LP API name, the function that we want to clobber, the P module entry, that should be the address at P import address table at the current index, indexed at I, with the replacement that we have already passed into this function. If that succeeds, we say found equals true, and if found, we'll go ahead and set the get proc address. After the loop, now if it was found and we were able to properly patch the import address table, then we want to return the address that we might work with here. The address of the function we can then call that has been our replacement. Now we have a bigger thing that we need to write. You know the functions get proc address and get module handle, those Win32 API functions that you normally use, oh, to try and go retrieve or reflectively find some function that you wanna call. Well, because they're Win32 API functions, functions, we don't really want our implementation to be hooked because it's our malware, right? So we should craft our own. We'll create our own replacements for get proc address and get module. Let me comment that line out one more time and let's go ahead and create some of the header files and source code to build out that functionality. Let's add a new header file for our get proc address dot H, our header file we can create here. As usual, we will include windows.h and let's define a far proc, get proc address replacement. And we'll pass in an H module and the string for the API name or the function call that we want here. Now I'll copy and paste this and let's define the source code. Inside the source file, let's go ahead and include the exact same header file. Let's go ahead and start to implement this function. And thankfully we can do a lot of similar stuff that we've already done in traversing that portable executable file. First thing, it's passed in though as a module and the handle here. So we should probably try to cast that. It is all pointers here, right? So let's do a p base in this case as a p byte, that we'll actually end up just casting our h module. The handle to our whole executable, right? Now I'm gonna steal, I'm gonna kinda copy and paste a lot of the same code, the syntax that we use to validate and verify that it is an executable file or a PE image that we're working with. So let me go grab that all here, but now we're working with our P base variable, not P target, correct? So let's correct those, and now we need to actually look for the functions that are being exported by this object. So we're not gonna be looking for import entries anymore, we're gonna be looking for export. We'll rename that variable to export data directory. And now let's cast that as a pointer should p image export directory for our p image exploiter. We can just use that exact same type and wrap that from our p base plus our export data directory and its virtual address that we know is present in that structure, correct? Now this is awesome because that export data directory includes all of the functions that are exposed by this portable executable. We can loop through them and actually find all those addresses, right? So let's define PD word for our function address array. We'll set that to the cast value of our P base and our P image exporter. Again, it's a pointer, so we use the arrow syntax address of functions, correct? 
we're gonna try and find the function address of what we actually want, right? So let's define a P function address, just being a pointer here. That can be set to null at the very start, but we are going to try and track it down. All this means is we're gonna have a whole lot of conditionals, kind of checking sort of the bounds here for our API name, even treating it as like hex, right? Zero X F F F, another F I think there. We'll grab a ordinal and actually set that to a cast representation of our LP API name and did with hex F F F F. And then we'll do a little bit of math, trying to track, oh, the base of our image export directory. We'll check if the ordinal is less than the base, in which case, okay, it's probably bad, or the ordinal is greater than the base and the total number of functions in our export directory. We should return null, because it's just not something we can track down. Otherwise, we can just try to track down the function address from taking the void pointer of the base that we started with, with the function address array that we were working with just a moment ago, with the ordinal minus the base. Does that make sense? There's a whole lot of moving parts here. Oh, and I missed a uh, closing parentheses there. Now I'm gonna add an else statement where I actually try to take a look for the function names, right? Let's do a function name array. Cast and calculating our P image export directory, reaching out for the address of names this time. We can do the exact same thing for the ordinals. We'll go ahead and define that and then reach for the address of name ordinals. And now finally, let's loop through all of those exported functions. Let's have a D ward I less than the image export directories number of functions, and we'll increment I as we loop through. We can then get the function name, that's a pointer again, or character array, that we cast from our P base, remember using that all as our reference point, and our function name array this time, indexed at I, the current index, correct? Then we can finally check if these strings compared together, given our LP API name and the P function name is equal to zero, and there's no differences, then we have the address. We have P function address finally being the void pointer of the P base that we add to to get our function address array given the function ordinal array at i. My goodness. Now I'm gonna add in one last component here, but it's a little bit messy and it relies on something that we haven't implemented yet because we're doing this recursively, trying to go find that function in some of those other forwarded function cases, right? So I'm gonna leave this commented out, but ultimately I wanna show you, hey, if we're in a location that's kind of odd, maybe greater than the export directory and moving things, whatever we need, we could actually try to move into another module, like the other thing that we want to reach out to, load that and then go find the function within it. That is what we do recursively here. We're actually gonna call this exact same function again for the other module that we might like. Uh, we'll then go ahead and release the module and free it, but ultimately that recursive capability is something that will be important for us, but this isn't ready yet because we need to go build out that, oh, get module handle replacement. So let me comment that out, but finally, at the end of the day, we will go ahead and return our point pointer for the function address that we uncover and find here. My goodness, after all that time, we still have work left to do, but that is our get proc address replacement function. Now we're getting close, we next need to build that get module handle function. As usual, let's add a new header file, .h extension, get module handle. We can include windows.h as usual. We could prototype and define our functions here, maybe an h module that will be returned out by our get module handle a replacement. And we can, we can pass in here our string for our module name. And we can go ahead and define that, but we might run into a wall here. There's some other structures that we still kind of need to dig into. Now, I gotta say, this video is already getting a little bit long, so I am gonna copy pasta this one. Let me paste this all in here, but I'll walk through a little bit of it because we end up including our utilities. We'll modify that. The default extension for DLLs that we wanna end up reaching for and our get module handle replacement. The thing is, we retrieve all this from the PEB. 
And that's another structure or the process environment block that we could find and pull out of the tab, the thread environment block. Is that right? Thread execution block, something? Mm -hmm. Thankfully, this is read out of a special register, but we still need to have these structures defined that we don't yet. We'll put those in in just a minute, but let me walk you through a little bit more of this code here. Hey, we're retrieving the module name and the image base address. We're checking to see if it even has the extension for a DLL. If it doesn't have the .dll extension, it concatenates these and adds them together. And then there are structures that we still need for us to be able to pull out different properties and fields here. We determine all the things that we need and then try to loop through it as usual with in-order memory links. And it is a linked list that we're digging through. We have mentioned in other videos, one other great resource to be able to go track down some of those structures, x64 debug, that awesome debugger does include some of the header files that kind of document and outline the structure of the process environment block and others. With all those definitions, let me create another header file like our structs.h as we did earlier for structures that we need to place in. I'll copy and paste all of this, have a couple extra pragma once there's at the end, and then in our get module handle header file, let's make sure that we do include those structs just as well. That should bring them into the same context of our get module handle C source code. And finally, there are no issues, there are no errors, we can properly access the PEB. At this point, I think, and I think, I know there are a lot of moving parts here, but I think we have all the puzzle pieces in place and we can finally kind of structure our malware to hook the import address table and maybe some of those function calls like, oh, create file or write file, things that we might be able to see like within Notepad as its process execution. Maybe we can manipulate it, modify it, and track all of that. So let's build out the skeleton to create our replacement functions. For those things like, oh, create file or write file, we can go find in the documentation everything that we need for this, and we can build out our own prototypes and define the function how we want it. Let's get back to our malware.c file, and we could go ahead and kind of structure this up at the top here. First of all, we need the function definition. We have this structure from the documentation, but we need to craft and define our own prototype because we're creating our own replacement function, right? So let's do a type def void, with the pointer here being create file w t, the type that we want, and that should take in these arguments, all with the types that are defined down below. Let me copy and paste these to build that out. D word, D word, etc. Okay, now that that is crafted, we can use that type to sort of represent what would have been the original create file function, right? We'll do create file w original, we'll start that off as null, but because we're kind of hooking this, we'll still have that context and we can still call the original function after anything that we want. Let's switch up this actual definition down here. I will make this void and I want to replace all those sort of in decorators with underscore uh, capital I N in. Perfect, we'll do the exact same for in optional. Replace those with in underscore opt. And now I want this to literally be the new function, right? So what I'm gonna end up doing is displaying out create file w has been hooked. Here is the file path, given the wide string of our LP file name, right? Where we are trying to create this file. And bear in mind, this is new functionality, right? This is being called and invoked. And of course, we'll still try to actually run the original function with that, right? So we can say calling original. In which case, we would just go ahead and run our create file w original, given all of the arguments that we had received, right? So I can just paste all of these in and build that out. And now that that function is done being implemented, what we can do is literally use our hook IAT function to get the original create file W function, but we'll end up patching it with what we want to begin with. So inside of our hook IAT function call, remember now we need to specify what Win32 API function from what module we actually want to tamper with. With that said, we need to end up using our get module handle replacement, but we need to pull that in with our header files. So let me go ahead and include 
get module handle.h. We can do the very, very same for our get proc address.h. And of course, we'll include the iat hook.h. Let's not forget that. That is the function that we need. So let's use our get module handle replacement function here. And we aren't going to pass in anything currently, but it is going to end up being worked through given our kernel 32.dll that we pass to our hook iat function. Then we'll go ahead and add the create file w, that method or that win32 API function that we want to clobber. And let's go ahead and put in our create file w hook function. We've got that defined just above. And you know what? It's probably going to make a little bit more sense if we call that create file w hook. So let me rename that function just above. And let's try to display those out. Let's go ahead and say our create file w hooked. And let's say that our create file w original address is at that zero uh, x percent p, right? We'll go ahead and display just the address of create file w original. Okay, I think I I think we finally have everything kind of in place here. Let me see if I can try to compile this and see how broken everything is. Let's go ahead and say, set this to release mode. Let's go ahead and build the solution. Hopefully no errors. Oh God, errors everywhere. Oh, it's whining about the uh, pch.h or the pre-compiled headers. I think I can change that in the settings, uh, the properties here of the project. I think it's under the C and C++ section. Yeah, pre-compiled headers, uh, no. Do not use pre-compiled headers. Let's hit apply and okay. Okay, I think we are just about there, but let's go make sure that our hook is doing what it should. Cause again, we did comment out that get proc address function. Now that we have that built out, we can do our get proc address replacement with our get module handle based off of the LP module name and the LP API name that we have passed in as parameters. And I should make sure our patch IAT entry does in fact return the uh, found entry here. That, that bool, that should be fine, right? That's all we need, I think. Just to be sure, let me make sure I include that get module handle and get proc address. I think things are okay. Now let's go to our DLL main and make sure, okay, I toggled that to enable our debug console and run the malware. Remove those comments here and make sure everything is imported. Let's see, can I build this and try it out? Fingers crossed, no errors, pretty please. Okay, one succeeded, looking good. Now, what I want to do is copy and paste this DLL path because I'll open up a terminal and then I'll go ahead and full screen this to move into our desktop where I do have that proc dll.exe already compiled and ready for me to use. Now that should inject our DLL into another process. So let's try it as a demo with notepad, right? We'll open that up and let's see, can I paste in our DLL and bring it to notepad.exe. Fingers crossed, um, it executed, but I don't know, can I, I can't see the output. I don't think it created my little debug console. If I just created an anything.txt document, well, it doesn't really do much. Uh, okay. So I have been reviewing this and I noticed a fatal flaw, a accident, a little mistake that I made. Uh, this function ordinal array, they're all ordinals, right? So they should not actually be cast to a PD word. They should just be a P word on their own. Uh, and with that, I think we now finally have everything set as we should. Uh, we are running our debug console and running the malware. So let's try to build this now and hope that it works. Fingers crossed, no errors in compilation. Okay, it's looking good. One succeeded, one built. So now we have our DLL created. Uh, let's see if we can go open up our terminal and then go use that proc DLL exe, DLL injector, and then see if we can get this fired up into notepad. So I will open up the terminal. I'll go ahead and full screen this. I'll move into my desktop because I do have the proc DLL exe in there. Now what I can do is just try to run that dot exe and it does require the complete DLL payload path and the process name. So our process, the target notepad in this example does need to already be running. So let's fire that up. And what I'm gonna do is just simply run our proc DLL dot exe 
paste in within quotes the full path that we have for our compiled DLL. And I don't know how well you can see it, but I am going to type notepad.exe at the very end of this command. Now I'll hit enter and there we go. Our malware is running. We can see that it has been running with the create file hook has been staged and set up. So what I could do is simply go ahead and put anything in here. Let's add a little uh, please subscribe and then let's go ahead and try to save this. I'll put this on my desktop as anything.txt and we should see, yeah, okay, our create file hooked ended up running and we get to see the argument where we stored that and that we'll call the original to make sure it is saved and ran. Look at that. The small primitive little proof of concept for our import address table hooking is working just fine in our custom malware. Now we can expand that just a little bit. Let's add some other functionality to hook into some of the other API functions. Let me close out of this and I'll hit enter to get out of the malware running. But now let's go tweak our source code back inside of our malware.c source code where we defined our create file hook. We built up this little prototype definition here. We want to do the exact same thing, follow the same procedure, but end up creating a new hook for our write file API function. Now I'm going to copy paste this one. I am going to just cruise through it for the sake of time here. But look, it's the exact same setup and structure. We define write file with its own type definition, have a tracker for the original API function call, and then build out the new function that we want to call. Now I'm doing something interesting here just to showcase it here. We are going to print out that we have hooked the contents of the file here. We've hooked that API function. And what we'll do is we'll actually add to the buffer or the stored text written in that document. All we're going to do is simply add hello, just okay, maybe some trailing string at the very, very end there and concatenate that on it to the stuff that's being saved. Of course, we call the original function, but because we've modified and tampered with the parameters, we now know and we can control what is actually in that file. Now, of course, if we do that, we do need to update our actual run malware function so we can create that hook. Let's go ahead and right after our create file W, make sure that we can steal the original just as well for the write file function. We'll use our exact same hook IAT, get module handle replacement and carve it out to get the write file function. Now we can display, we have stolen just the original value for create file W and write file and ultimately our hook will be called instead. Let's compile and build all of this. Let me see if I can run that one more time. No errors, looking good. So I'll go do the exact same test. We'll get back to our command line. We'll make sure notepad is running. I do want to restart because again, hey, it'll be running in the memory space of that executable of that process. So I'm going to start from a fresh one here, but let me go ahead and run the exact same command, just up arrow on my keyboard. I'll hit enter and look at that. Now we have found the hook we have staged and we've prepared what the original function would have been. We can display that out here, but let me get back to our notepad instance. And let's say this is from John. Give Maldev Academy a try. We'll go ahead and save this. We can just call that maldev.txt on the desktop. Now you won't see it in this notepad buffer in this window right away, but checking out our debug console, looks like that ended up being closed. But if I open notepad one more time and then I actually go navigate to our maldev.txt file, automatically it has added our hello function because that's all that we told it to do, but we could manipulate and tamper with those parameters and arguments however we wanted. We have literally hooked the function. Isn't that so cool? Like we have literally laid the foundation, put out the groundwork and built the structure and skeleton for us to write more custom malware where we can easily retrieve whatever functions we want with our own natural get proc address and get module handle replacements and that we can modify manipulate and tamper and hook into any other win32 api function that's just so cool i think it's awesome i hope you didn't mind the little bit of notepad demo a small simple thing but it gets the point across that we can control what happens on the machine and hey, we get to learn all about that with Maldev Academy. If you haven't given them a try, seriously, there's a lot of incredible material there. And please, please, please start at the beginning. Start with the ramp of all the courses and all the modules that are necessary. I know they're always adding new updates, but don't start with the updates. Those can be a little bit overwhelming if you're still just diving in. Try to see where the sweet spot is of the knowledge you already have in the course material that's already presented to you. I know I've seen some YouTube comments. Hey, it can be a little bit tough diving into everything. But anyway, I'm sorry. I'm on a tangent, please, please, please give Maldive Academy a try. Huge thanks to them for sponsoring this video. Some incredible stuff there. And thanks so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.